Ontological calculus is historically the study of connections between sequences that appear totally unrelated on the surface. So named because it was so mysterious and unexpected when it was first conceived. I'll be assuming you're familiar with the basics of classical calculus, how to differentiate and integrate some functions, what those things represent graphically, where they come from, and how they're related via the fundamental theorem. The binomial theorem and binomial coefficients also play a fairly important role, so you should know at least a little bit about those two before watching. We'll also be using some series expansions and complex numbers, but you should be fine following along without those things. One quick note on notation, instead of the Leibniz notation for derivatives and integrals you probably used to, we'll be using these fancy D and I symbols. This is one to emphasize how we'll be treating them as operators acting on functions, and two to keep the notation decluttered and uniform, since we'll be staying in one variable anyway. We'll start by talking about the analogous theory of discrete calculus, noticing some weird similarities on the way until we're actually able to get a firm handle on those apparent coincidences and, you know, use them. Let's take an example, f of x equals x squared. From classical calculus, we know that the derivative, the continuous rate of change, the gradient of the tangent at each point, of this function is 2x. But now, in discrete calculus, we only care about the discrete rate of change. How much is the value of x squared changing at each step here? In other words, what do we need to add to x squared to get x plus 1 squared? Well, just by rearranging the question, we get the answer, which simplifies down to 2x plus 1. This discrete rate of change thing, delta, is known as the forward difference operator, and in general it's defined in a function by f of x plus 1 minus f of x. An important property of delta is that it's linear, that is, it's additive, the sum of the deltas of two functions is the same as the delta of the sum of those functions. And it also commutes with scalar multiplication. Just like in classical calculus, where differentiation is inverse to integration, taking the forward difference is the inverse of taking a sum. We can see this by reframing this observation we made in orange. 9, for example, 3 squared, is equal to 1 plus 3 plus 5. That is, the sum from 0 to 2 of 2n plus 1. And for any positive integer x, we can express x squared as the sum from 0 to x minus 1 of 2n plus 1. We can show this more generally by telescoping. We'll look at the sum from some arbitrary constant a to x minus 1 of some arbitrary function f of n. Write out these deltas in full using the definition. Swap some terms around, and suddenly everything just cancels out, leaving us with just f of x minus this constant term f of a. The result we end up with looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? It's very similar to the fundamental theorem of calculus, and it really is just the discrete analogue of that theorem. We could call it the fundamental theorem of discrete calculus, but that doesn't seem to have caught on for some reason. And this is really useful. It means that finding a summation formula for, say, n squared, certainly not a trivial problem, is equivalent to finding a function whose delta is x squared. Just like how derivatives tend to be easier than integrals, forward differences are easier than sums. We just plug stuff into the definition of delta and simplify. If we rearrange this equation to get x on its own, we can substitute this expression into the x term down here, clean that up a little bit, and since delta x is just 1, we can go ahead and slap a delta x on the end there. By doing this, we get an equation where everything except the x squared term is in terms of delta. So once we get the x squared on its own, 
by linearity we can pull delta to the front. And that's it. We're done. We found a function whose delta is x squared. In other words, we derived a summation formula for n squared, and we did it from scratch. If you spend a bit more time messing with this algebra, you end up with this famous formula that you've probably seen before. Now, this video would be incomplete without at least mentioning indefinite summation. It can be defined like this, as the inverse of the forward difference. And the indefinite sum of a function is unique up to a constant term, just like the indefinite integral. The main reason I like this operator is that it means we don't need to mess around introducing a second variable like n to use in the sum and. A nice, almost shorthand for those of you who might want to try some of this stuff for yourself. Okay, there's one last thing we need to talk about before getting to the umbral stuff. Falling powers are kinda like powers, kinda like factorials. They're decreasing products, starting at x with n terms. They look a bit weird if you haven't seen them before, but if you start playing with them you'll soon find something interesting. x to the falling power n minus 1, for example, is the same product, just without the rightmost term. And x plus 1 to the falling n is the same product, but starting at x plus 1 instead of x. Notice how this x to the falling n minus 1 appears as a subproduct in both of these other expressions. Let's sub that in. Now when we consider the delta of x to the falling n, we get this common factor in yellow. Combine like terms, and this simplifies down to nx to the falling n minus 1, which definitely looks familiar, right? In fact, it turns out this déjà vu is exactly the motivation we need to create our umbral transformation. Quick side note, falling powers can be extended to negative n with this definition, which preserves this forward difference property. Again, a pretty important thing to know about, but we're not going to be talking specifically about this in this video. So we have these two eerily similar equations, seemingly hinting at some connection between classical and discrete calculus. What can we do with them? Well, what if we introduce a new linear operator, let's call it phi, that transforms powers of x into their corresponding falling powers? Then we see that taking the derivative of a power of x, and then taking the phi, is the same as taking the phi first, and then taking the delta. By linearity, we can extend this identity to all polynomials, and a bunch of other functions we can get to via series expansions. I like this more concise, more abstract form of the idea. Now, notice that we can't divide through by phi to get d equals delta, and that's because left and right multiplication by phi are not the same thing. We can, however, multiply through on the right by phi inverse, when it exists, to get something like this. This also applies to sums and integrals, which we get just by reading the diagram right to left instead of left to right. There's something I find kind of magical about this, how we can take a classical calculus problem, governed by smooth curves and limits and stuff, turn it into a discrete problem, where we're essentially just counting blocks, and then bring the solution back to its original context with phi inverse, or vice versa. For instance, if we were so inclined, another way to derive a summation formula for n squared would be to take the inverse phi, integrate from 0 to x, and then apply phi to that integral, giving us the same answer we just found. Now clearly, to be able to use this umbral transformation, we need to know how to actually compute phi and its inverse. How do we do that? Well, for polynomials at least, it's pretty straightforward. The phi of x to the n is just x to the falling n, by definition. And for phi inverse, we can use exactly the same trick we used earlier for delta inverse x equals phi x, so we can substitute that in here. And then, after isolating the x squared term, we can multiply through by phi inverse. Using this method, we can find the phi and phi inverse of any polynomial. Now, you might notice these tables resemble Pascal's triangle, and they are connected. 
The coefficients we have over here on the left are called the signed Stirling numbers of the first kind, and they have a nice recurrence relation. If you take any pair of adjacent coefficients, then multiply the first one by the negative of the row number, and add them up, you get the coefficient underneath. These coefficients on the right, known as unsigned Stirling numbers of the second kind, have a similar recurrence relation, though this time we're multiplying that first number by the exponent on the term it gains them. Add them up, and you get the term below. These recurrence relations are often expressed using brackets and braces like this. We do this to emphasize the similarity with the parenthetic representation of the binomial coefficients, which have a similar recurrence relation. These kinds of relationships are at the heart of umbral calculus. These sequences and their combinatorics deserve a video all of their own, but for now we only need one for them. n choose k is equal to n to the falling k over k factorial. This is best understood combinatorially. The numerator, n to the falling k, counts the number of permutations of k objects you can make, given a choice of n objects n choices for the first, n minus 1 for the second, and so on. While the denominator, k factorial, counts the total number of possible permutations of k objects. The quotient, then, is the number of ways you can choose k objects out of n, ignoring the order, that is, n choose k. We can use this fact to compute phi for a couple more functions, starting with e to the ax, where a is an arbitrary constant. Recall the series expansion for this function, the sum from 0 to infinity of a to the n x to the n over n factorial. By definition, applying phi to this just means replacing the powers of x with falling powers, which as we just saw when divided by n factorial gives x choose n. This might look familiar already. Recall the binomial theorem? It states that a plus b to the x equals the sum from 0 to infinity of x choose n times a to the n b to the x minus n. When b is 1, well, that's exactly what we're looking for. So there we go, the phi of e to the ax is a plus 1 to the x. We can also do sine, which we'll express in its complex exponential form. By doing this, once we apply phi, we can use the exponential phi formula we just found, Use Euler's identity to convert these complex numbers from Cartesian to polar form. Take the root 2 to the x out as a common factor. And finally, observe the complex form of sine once more to get that this equals sine x pi over 4. We can use the same technique to compute the phi of cosine. And I won't go into the details because they're surprisingly finicky, but it turns out the phi of the natural log is the harmonic series. These results definitely provide more insight into some of the calculus facts we already know and love. And they also open up a lot more questions. I'll finish off by showing you something cool that Phi can do, which I never knew about before working on this video. Take a McLaurin series expansion of a general function f. When we take the Phi of all this, we know that means replacing the powers of x with falling powers. And again, we can express this fraction as x choose n. Now, let's look again at this equation, and square both sides. This phi and phi inverse cancel each other out, and iterating the exact same logic, we get this equation, relating the nth forward difference to the nth derivative. Multiply through on the right by phi, and we can substitute this in down here. And finally, this purple function, phi f, we can rename to just f. What we've just derived is the discrete version of the McLaurin series, known as Newton's forward difference formula. And the way we did it shows that the two are actually the same thing up to isomorphism, which, I don't know, just kind of made me smile when I first saw it. Of course, there is so much more to talk about, and so many different directions we can take this in from here. For now, I hope I managed to whet your appetite a little, and that you at least got something out of this. I do intend to make at least one follow-up video, so if you want to see more advanced discrete calculus, the combinatoric stuff I mentioned, whatever, please let me know. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.